Hello and welcome back to the shop. This is the second and final video for the bandsaw restoration. If you haven't seen my first video, I'll leave a link in the description. And at the end of that video, I mentioned what we were going to do in this video. So in summary, we're going to put the motor in the bottom of the lower cabinet there. And I want to add a zero volt release switch which is a safety switch that stops the bandsaw starting up if there was an event where the power failed and then came back on again. So those switches have electromagnet components in them and when the power is cut then that magnet stops working and the switch needs to be manually activated again. So that switch is going to take the place of this old switch here and I'm going to mount that halfway up on the bandsaw in a more convenient place than where this switch was mounted previously. The bandsaw table here will be cleaned up. There's quite a bit of surface rust on here. It doesn't feel too bad. There might be a little bit of pitting, I'm not sure, but we'll get into that once we clean that off. And these four brass bits here are the guide blocks for the blade, and they need to be all milled nice and flat because they're quite at an angle there and they are meant to be flat to um, guide the blade. And lastly I'll fit the blade and the shroud around the blade and I'm going to show you how to set up the blade so it runs nice and true and the best chance to give you great cuts. I start by milling these brass blocks and I'm just squaring it up in the vise here with this small square. And I'm taking very light cuts here because I didn't want to kick the part over in the vise. And that looks pretty good so I continue on and do the other three. And once they're done I just screw them into the guide holes here just so I don't lose them. And these are the bottom guide holes for the other two. Now I'm going to work on the table itself. I don't know if you saw that, the rag kind of lifted up a bit there and I was a bit scared it was going to get caught up in the wire wheel. So I removed the rag and I just clamped it down to the table. This table cleaned up really well. And I'm just using a bit of sandpaper on a stick here to knock down any high points that were sticking up. I clean out the round circle for the insert, there's a little bit of dirt in there as well. And then I clean the table down in acetone so that I can paint it. This is actually an undercoat, it's a different colour to what I normally use. And once dry, I come back and give it a top coat. Next, I start working on the motor and I'm just cleaning up some of the loose stuff on the top there. And I give it a good blow out with the air gun as well. Now this lead is too short, so I'm going to have to put a longer lead on here. I unscrew the two nuts holding the power cables and take that out. And then I've found a bit of bright orange cable, which will work really well for this motor. This cable was thicker than the original cable, so it should be okay. I don't really trust just crimping, so I'll also solder these connectors onto the wires as well. And then I come back and use a bit of heat shrink to cover those connections. The cable is fed through the grommet. And those connections are put onto the studs as they were before and tightened up. Now for the earth I'm just sanding up the housing here just to make sure I get a really good connection. And I've left that loose while I put the cover on. There's a little recess in the cover there that the wire can poke through. 
that's how it's supposed to be, but that's not how it was when I took it apart. This motor has a couple of oiling points, and I open those little lids there and just squirt a little bit of oil in there for the bearings. The motor is fitted into the cabinet. And then I put the belt on. These square nuts were original and I'm swapping them out for these nylock nuts here so that the motor won't come loose. Those bolts are put in place and then tightened up with a ratchet. And there's a couple on the other side here as well. Now this belt is really loose and I adjust it by undoing the bolts here and lowering that bottom shelf. This orange cable from the motor needs to come through the cabinet here down the bottom. And I'm going to use a longer piece of this tubing as a conduit. And what I'll do is I'll cut a hole at the top here and I'll mount the zero volt release switch in there. This is the tubing which I'm cutting the length at 800 millimeters long. I'm just carefully going along the lines here until we finally cut it off. Now there is a bit of surface rust and I clean all that up with a wire wheel on the angle grinder. This conduit needs a right angle in it so I'm using the square here to mark some lines so that I can cut them and that'll give me a right angle. I carefully cut along those lines on both sides. And then I take that little triangle piece out. And then that's tapped up till it's right angle. I have it clamped to the bench here and I've also got this other clamp pushing on the side. So that allows me to keep the right angle here while I weld it. I actually have a video on making that clamp that's in the bench there. So if you're interested, you can have a look at that. There's a little plate that goes on the end of that bent piece and that has a 20 millimeter hole and an eight millimeter hole. I use the drill press initially to drill out the eight millimeter hole. And then I finish it off in the milling machine. Now this hole is actually 26 millimeter hole. I had to make it bigger. The last step is to cut the piece off the length. Now it's clamped to the right angle piece and I'm just tacking it in a couple of places here. And then I take it over to the bandsaw and I test fit it to see if it's right and it's absolutely perfect. I'm happy with that. That tubing is clamped onto the machine and then I mark out where I need to drill the holes to mount it. Those holes are drilled out. Now for the top hole and I will weld this hole up later on. I'm putting a nut on the other side here and the part is bolted on. And then that nut is welded inside the tubing. Now I need to drill a hole for the cable gland. Just a quick deburr there on the edge. This is the cable for the motor, which will go up inside the tubing. I also need to drill a hole in the bottom of the tubing for another cable gland. And just clean the edges up. This is the cable that goes to the wall outlet. Cables are fed through the tubing and they come out the top here. One cable for the motor 
and one cable from the wall outlet. What I'll do is I'll put the switch about here and I'll also need to put a plug on the end of this cable. The switch finally arrived. Man, that took like a week to come. I'm not sure what it is with some transport companies, but I did buy something else from the same area and that came overnight. Anyway, the switch needs to go on the side here. And I've just sort of found out that we don't have a lot of room here to put the connectors on. So what I'm gonna do is space it out by probably 10 millimeters or 3 8 of an inch. And I'm gonna make up a little spacer block out of this aluminium that I used in my last project. But that will go in between here. And then that should give me enough room here to get these terminals on. So I cut that block down a little bit first so that it's less milling to do. And then I square it up using the Joe Pie method, cleaning down the top, and then coming back around all four sides. Then I flip the part over on two parallels and I clean the bottom up. Now the top and the bottom have good true surfaces. And I've got the block sitting on only one parallel on the fixed drawer. And then I'm start cleaning up all those sides. Now this block is too thick so I need to take a chunk of it off. And I'm using my big milling cutter here. This has got five carbide bits on it so it makes easy work of this job. Nice slow finish pass at the end there. I measure that up and that is perfect. Now I need to drill two holes in the same position of the switch. And I also need to cut out the centre. So I'm just using a end mill here. I plunge down and back and forth until I've broken through. And then I cut it all out and this is just a finishing pass around the outside of the pocket. The switch fits on there like that. Now the switch needs to be mounted to the tubing and I use the block here as a guide to drill the M4 holes that I need to screw the switch on with. I bolt down the first end that we've already done and I use the block as a guide for the second hole or just to mark it. And then I come in and finish it off and that gets tapped out to the same. Now I need to cut out an area for the switch to go through and I've drilled holes in the corner just to make it easier to cut it out with the grinder. Of course we need to do a bit of filing to make it nice and smooth in there as well. This is how the switch gets bolted onto the tubing. The switch fits in here really good and it's taken up no, probably a little over half of the width of this tubing. So I'll be able to get the wires on there quite easily. The next thing is to make a, a cap for the top here. So I want to put an earth wire onto the steel. So what I was going to do instead of welding a cap on, I was just going to bolt a cap on. And then I'll be able to get in there and connect up the earth wire. And the last thing to do with this aluminium block here is to chamfer for the corners off a little bit so that um, that's nice and rounded there. All the work on the tubing is done so I'm just giving it a final clean up with the wire wheel. Then it's all cleaned down in acetone. And I prime it with some priming paint. Then come back and finish it with the hammered finish paint. While the paint is drying on the electrical conduit, I'm going to fit and adjust the blade. Now there's a bunch of steps in setting up the blade and adjusting it properly. 
And this is by no means my ideas. This came from a guy called Alex Snodgrass. And he does have a YouTube channel as well. I'll put a link in the description. But he does a number of very good videos on bandsaw setup. And he's been involved with bandsaws for many, many years. So he has a lot of experience with them. So I'm going to go through all his steps and I'll explain them as we go through. And then hopefully this will cut straight as a die when it's done. Okay, so the first step is safety. So if you're doing any of these bandsaw blade changes or you've got the bandsaw door open for any reason, you should unplug your bandsaw from the wall and that will eliminate any accidental start up and accident that could happen. Now in this case, I don't have a plug on the end of the lead and also I've got the other part painting. So I actually have the lead in my hand. So there's no chance for this bandsaw to start up. Alex says that if you have a table on here, and I haven't actually put our table on, but if you do have a table on, if you take it off, it'll make this whole process a lot easier to do. And the first step is to back off all of the guides, the thrust bearings, um, your guide blocks here, or bearings if you've got bearings. Just push them out so that you've got big gaps in here, and these things are all pushed all the way back or wound all the way back in. And that lets the blade run freely in here and makes it easier for us to set all the adjustments. The next step is to put the blade on the wheels and through the guide area. Oh, what's happened here? I've cut the teeth the wrong way on the blade. What the f***? Okay, half of you are wondering what I'm talking about, half of you are laughing at the joke, and the other half have probably tuned out already. The manufacturer hasn't put the teeth the wrong way on the blade. The blade is uh, twisted the wrong way round, so we just have to twist it back, and then these teeth will be pointing down the way they should be. Now, it's always best to use gloves when you do this. You can basically just twist the blade around like that. And it flicks around the other way. Most bandsaws will have some sort of blade tensioning adjuster here at the top. Uh, it could be a knob like this, or there might be some sort of lever mechanism. And basically, it just lifts that top wheel up. And then as the top wheel goes up, that blade gets tighter. So I'm just adjusting this down. And you can see the blue portion here is moving up slowly. Now, in regards to tensions, a lot of bandsaws have gauges on them for different size blades and things like that. This bandsaw doesn't have any of that stuff. In Alex's videos he says uh, do the tension up and then tap the blade until you get about an eighth uh, movement both ways. Not pushing the blade like that but just tapping it and you should get no more than about an eighth movement which is about three millimeters. So I think the tension is kind of right where we are so we'll carry on from here. Although all of these steps from Alex are important steps and they should be done in the sequence that we're doing them in, this one here is pretty important because a lot of people get it wrong. So Alex says that the gullet where the teeth are cut away here should be right in the center of the wheel. So a lot of people think that the blade should be in the center of the wheel, but it's not the blade, it's the gullet in the center of the wheel there. So this wheel is about 32 millimeters thick. So the gullet will be around about 16 millimeters and it's around about there now. Now on the back of my bandsaw by the uh, tensioning knob here, there's a, another knob here which um, adjusts the wheel this way. And that allows you to track that blade to the middle of the wheel there or the, or the gullets to the middle of the wheel. And once you have that in the right position, then you can just tighten this locking nut up and that should keep that nice and solid. Alex mentions another mistake that some people make is they're trying to 
line up their wheels coplanar and in most cases with bandsaws the wheels are not comb planar and they're like that for a reason. So for example you can see here on the top wheel we have the gullets in the center of the tire here so we have a big black part here and the, a little black part there so you can see that the blades kind of backwards a little bit so that the gullets are in the middle and when we look down at the bottom blade you can see here that the teeth are closer to the front of the tire here and there's a bigger gap at the back. So this wheel here is not in direct line with the upper wheel. Anyway, the point he makes is don't go adjusting them. They're like that for a reason. As long as we have the gullets in the center of the wheel at the top, it doesn't matter where they are down the bottom here. The next step in the process is to position these side guys in the correct place and they're based on these little brass blocks here and if you had bearings it would be based on the bearings but basically we want this front edge of the block to be just behind the gullet here. I think he mentioned about a sixteenth of an inch which is about a millimeter and a half. It is a bit hard to see with the camera angles and stuff, but it's this block here needs to be, or the front edge of it, needs to be about a millimetre and a half behind the lowest part of that gullet. Now mind you, we're talking about this whole block and, you know, the forward and backward movement. We're not talking about adjusting these guides in and out at this point. We'll get onto that a little bit later on. So it's this distance just in here, it should be about a sixteenth of an inch. Now this is what Alex calls the most critical adjustment here, and it's the thrust bearing at the back. So some bandsaws have the bearing going this way, some of them have them turned around 90 degrees and they run on the surface here, uh, but it doesn't matter, it's the clearance that you have on the blade here which is important. And again, he recommends that it be somewhere around about a sixteenth, but even closer. So close enough that it's not touching the blade when you spin the blade free wheeling like this. But if you do push on the blade ever so slightly, it'll touch the bearing. So you can see here I need to wind this forward quite a bit. So it's around about there and Alex says don't worry about putting a dollar bill or anything in there um, just wheel the ham round freely like this and it should just not move until you put a little bit of pressure on the blade which I've done below and then it moves and then if I take the pressure off yeah maybe it's just a fraction forward because it does move sometimes but that's how you set it up anyway. The next step are the side guides. So uh, we're talking about these brass blocks that go in or if you've got bearings that go in. So they need to go in and be very close to the blade but not actually touch the blade. So just have a very small amount of gap there each side. So that is the blade all set up and tensioned. Now you'd do another step and that would be to level the table. But uh, I don't have the table on here at the moment, but when I do put the table on I'll show you how that gets done. The paint's now dry so it's time to fit the tubing onto the bandsaw and run the wires up this inside of it. Then it's time to wire up the switch. I'm cutting all the insulation off, stripping the wires and putting terminals which match the switch on the wires. Now I don't trust crimping them so again I'm soldering these terminals on as well. And then I put on some heat shrink and use the heat gun to shrink those plastic sleeves. 
the earth wires are connected to this brass bolt that's inside the tubing. Then I fit those wires onto the switch. And the switch is screwed into the tubing. The next step is to put the plug on the end of the cable. It's just a standard three pin plug. Then I run some tests to make sure we've got no connection from phase and neutral to earth. And then I also run some earth testing to make sure we've got minimal resistance. I install all of the covers and start with the pulley cover here. Then one side of the motor cover. And then the other side. I've made a little bracket up down the bottom for the bottom bolt. It didn't have one there previously. Now the table gets fitted. There are three bolts underneath that need to be tightened up. I put the insert in and it probably seen better days and we'll need to make a new one at some point. Finally the side cover. Now I'm squaring up the table with the blade with a little machinist square. This is the first time cutting some wood and this is a test that Alex mentions as well. So you cut a little bit into your piece of wood, turn the saw off, then flip your wood over and bring it in from the back. And if it fits on your blade, then your table is square. Well, that is the bandsaw restoration all completed or mostly completed. It's a little bit late at night. That's the first cut I've done on it and that went pretty well I thought through there. Now this video is pretty much complete however there are a couple of things that I'll finish off off camera. One is a cap for here and I think this is kind of a standard size so I'm gonna see if I can either buy one which will probably be the quickest way to go or if not I'm gonna make something up on my 3D printer uh, to fit in here. So that should work pretty good there for that. The other thing is the power lead. At the moment I've just got it draped over the little knob at the top there. But what I might do is just put something maybe over here on the conduit that I made up. Just a little uh, hook, maybe a, a bolt that comes out with a um, bent up. And then the cord can just hook over that. And the last thing I want to do is add some dust extraction. So I think it was in part one I mentioned that I wanted to put some kind of uh, vacuum around the blade here. I've seen a couple of videos and this is the best way to catch the dust or the chips coming off the bandsaw blade right underneath the plate and would make up some sort of uh, mechanism that goes slides on forward here and is attached to the table and has a slot in it and it's connected to your vacuum and then that can pull in the dust as it cuts the wood at the top and, and drags it through the table there. I was going to do that in this video but this is kind of dragged on a little bit too long so I'll do that in another video as I think that will need a little bit of design and thinking on how we're going to do it and it might take a little time to fabricate something. I will also need other tools and jigs for the bandsaw, maybe some kind of sled that runs in this groove here. Another jig for cutting round items. It's typically some type of V that you can put the round item in. And I think there's a bunch of other jigs that I've seen on YouTube which would be very handy for the bandsaw. Again, all that stuff will be in other videos. Well, I'm quite happy with the result of this restoration and I'm 
looking forward to using this bandsaw. I hope everyone has a great day and as always, thanks for watching.